In the spirit of reconciliation, the entire team at Curious Freedom acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, waters and community. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people listening today. I would like to acknowledge in particular the Darug people who are the original custodians on the land on which I record this podcast. Thank you for showing us what curious freedom can look like. Hello and welcome to Curious Freedom Podcast with Kessie Faruja. That's me and friends. And today I have two friends with me. I have Bin, who you know, and our good friend Jonathan Moore, who is a friend of both of us. And we're so excited to have him on because we're talking about stress. And this is his area of expertise. Jonathan is a coach and chiropractor with over 20 years of clinical experience. His main focus over that time has been the impact that stress has on the brain and the results that overload has on the physical health, mental health, and emotional health. So he is the perfect person to come and talk to us about how we can get curious about stress and what stress does to our bodies. So welcome, John. Hey, thanks, Kirst. Thanks, Ben. It's good to be here. Awesome. So... You know, we all know what it's like to get stressed, but do we really know what's actually happening when we're stressed? So we thought it would be a great opportunity to pick John's brain, which is a very awesome brain to pick. Uh, He wears many hats (laughs) in his life and is, as we've said, an expert in looking at stress and the impact it has on our brain and our bodies. So I guess, John, if you could tell us a little bit about what actually is stress. Yeah, absolutely. I think stress gets a bad rap. Stress is kind of like this thing that uh, we talk about. It's like our world gets overwhelmed and these sorts of things. Uh, And certainly that is part of stress. I'll talk about that in a second. But stress is actually necessary. Stress is the sort of thing that gets us up and moving and gets us moving towards achieving things and doing things and living life. And so stress is not all bad, but really stress that goes into overload is the bad space. And so really there's a couple of different places we can chat about it and we'll probably talk more about the overload because that's where most people struggle, to be honest. But stress is just this, it's the body sort of preparing to do something, preparing to go. And we might talk a bit about what happens in the brain and the body and the the fight-flight response, which is what happens when we face stress. But um, but yeah, I, I guess stress is not all bad. Until we get into that overload place. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So what different kinds of stress are there? You've said stress is not all bad. Mm. So what mm-hmm. does that look mm-hmm. like? Yeah. I mean, stress is everywhere. And, and so in terms of anything that challenges us, basically we could call a stress. Going to the gym is a stress. Uh, it's simply not just the, I have to get <laughs> up and get out here and it's stressful to get to the gym, that sort of place. But also just like lifting weights or doing exercise stresses the body and it helps us to grow. And so this would be in the good mm-hmm. stress. Uh, and that would be a physical stress. But of course, if physical stress goes too far, we go into overload, we can get physical trauma and physical stresses on our body from over-exercising would be one. Most people don't struggle with over-exercise, <laughs> of course. They struggle with under-exercise. But, um, but also physical stresses like postures and, and sitting poorly and lifting incorrectly, physical stresses, accidents and injuries, it's going to be a physical stress as well. So physical is one kind. Chemical stresses mm-hmm. we face. And so uh, our world is full of toxins and bits and pieces like that. And, and these things doesn't take much until we go into the overload with the chemical stress. And so our body's got to deal with that and deals with it in a very similar to way to a physical stress because all stress sort of evokes the same response. So with physical stresses, chemical stresses, and of course the one that gets most attention when people talk stress is emotional yeah. stress. People think, oh man, I- I'm stressed, or, I'm, I'm burnt out or I'm, those sorts of things. And that's tapping into the emotional stress. And again, we've got this safe zone that we can play with an emotional load. But if we go past our tolerance, if we go past what we can handle, then we're in trouble. So I drop it into those three big categories, physical, chemical, and emotional, and they all accumulate. And here's another key thing I think is that people think, well, I'm busy and I'm running around and my time's short and I'm doing all of these things, which could be a physical stress, but I haven't been very emotionally stressed, but then something little happened. And the physical and the chemical and the emotional, they all accumulate to the point of overload. Mm -hmm. 
And, and so they're not three separate buckets. They're all in one bucket and, and they all have an impact. And again, they all, if we go past overload cumulatively, that's that's when we're in strife, that's when we're in trouble. But yeah, that, that kind of helps people to understand that it's not just the one thing, it's the physical, chemical mm. and emotional. Yeah, that's so, really interesting because yeah. I guess we can pigeonhole it and like, oh, well, it's my stress is just emotional stress or that's the only thing. But yeah. then forgetting that there's other stresses in your life and as they're filling up too, that's going to tip you over at mm. some point. Totally. Uh, just the other thing, I talk chemical stress and I talk toxins, but of course the food we eat, the stuff we put on our skin, the the different things that we're absorbing is also good for us or stressful for us. And so that also fits in that bucket yeah, as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think most of our listeners would resonate definitely with emotional stress and having felt that and being that we talk about decluttering and organizing and the emotional stress that clutter can create Mm -hmm. in your life. So Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is actually happening in our bodies when we get to that point of overload or overwhelm, because most of Mm -hmm. what we deal with with our clients or our community online is talking about the overwhelm and helping people bring it back and to deal with that. Yeah, totally. Let's look at it as Mm -hmm. a spectrum of like even the good, like where we're tolerating it. And then we'll plug it into the the overwhelm because it's the same thing, just gone too far. Okay. And so let's, let's frame it not as our everyday life in 2023, as we record this, like it's busy and it's stuff's going on, but let's pull it right back to the place of the primitive stress response. What happens in the body automatically when we get stressed. And so let's think about being chased by a lion, which I've never done. I don't know if either of you know, no lions in in, in our, (laughs) but we can picture it, right? A bear jumps at us, a lion jumps at us. And straight away, the first thing that has to happen is our brain has to go, oh, something's dangerous here. Something is going to threaten me. Okay. We call this the recognize the stress place. So, So recognize, respond and recover, which I'll come back to. Recognizing stress is crucial. If we don't realize that we're in a threatening situation, Okay, we're not going to do anything Mm. about it. The brain has all these automatic senses, if you like, parts of the brain that are looking for stress. They're looking and they're they're scoping the environment to say, is this dangerous? Is this going to be threatening? Am I okay here? And so this is part of the brain's recognition of stress. Of course, if you're a, I don't know, a gazelle or something (laughs) in the the savannah and a lion jumps out at you and you don't recognize that, there's no stress response. There's no nothing. You just lunch real quick. Okay. So the recognition of stress is critical for us to be able to mount a response and do something about it. As I said, hardwired into the brain for the aficionados, it's the part of the brain basically is called the amygdala. Okay. It's a little bit of the brain, the limbic system, if you've come across that. Looking for stress. This is the recognize what happens. As soon as something in our environment is now stressful, Uh, our brain goes, hold on, I have to pay attention to that and I have to mount a response to it. This then is the fight flight response. All right. Okay. Everybody knows, uh, everybody's heard of fight and flee, but think about it. Imagine you have just had a lion jump out at you, but what happens, um, Ben, I'm going to ask you, what happens to your heart rate? Well, straight away. Very quickly. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, What happens to your breathing rate? Increase also. Increase. Yeah. Kirsty, what happens to muscle tension, do you reckon? Increase or decrease? Uh, Increase. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So everything kicks into this. I'm breathing faster. My heart's pumping more. My muscles are tense. I'm ready to fight or flee this lion, right? We all know those three things, uh, muscle tension, heart rate, and breathing rate, but everything in the body gears to the fight flight. Mm. So just quickly, things that need to increase to survive go up. So all of the cardiovascular system, heart and blood and lungs, boom, through the roof, muscles through the roof. But the things we don't need to survive in that moment, they all get turned down. Okay. So so what gets turned down? Digestion turned off. Uh, Filtering blood through like the the liver and the kidneys and those things, it gets turned off. Reproductive cycles, hormones, they all get turned off. You don't need any of those things in the moment of survival. You may need them (laughs) afterwards, but not in the moment of survival. You've got to get all of your energy in to fighting or fleeing. Okay. So everything gears into this. That's in the body. Let's look in the brain for a second. The part of the brain, if you put your hand across your mm-hmm. forehead, right under your hand is what's called the, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex. It's what makes humans humans uh, in that it's the part of the brain that's there for logical thinking and reason and rational thought and creativity and all these things, which as humans, we have much more than any other mammal on the earth. That gets switched off 
in the moment of fight flight. So it gets turned off. All of our logical thinking, our reason, our rational thought, our creativity, who needs that right now? We're running from a lion or we're going to fight this guy if we're crazy, I guess. <laughs> and so that gets switched off. And what gets switched on is all the back part of the brain, which is all about survival. And that's the part of the brain that drives the change in uh, heart rate and blood pressure and pulse and, and breathing and muscle tension and all of these things. It gets driven by the back part of the brain. And the brain says, I can't do both things at once. I'm not going to think logically about fighting this lion. It's just all instincts. I don't have time for logic. Mm. So this is what's happening in the brain and the body as a bit of an overview in that fight flight response so that we can address the threat right in front of us. I've never been chased by a lion. You guys haven't either. But the same thing happens when we face any stressor that, that is a threat to our system. The same response right through the body in terms of the front a part of the brain, prefrontal cortex is off, the back part of the brain's on, heart rate, muscle tension, all of those things. That's okay in the mm. short term. You know, running from a lion, Ben, how long is the pursuit? If, if you're running from a lion... <laughs> Or, or yep. someone you know who's a good runner, yeah. right? If they're running from a lion. I would be lunch, but someone else, like my husband maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, you're going you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna climb a tree, okay, Yeah. quickly, because you realize I can't do this. Logical thinking, instinct takes over and goes yep. up, right? Somebody else, your husband, yeah. boom, he's out of there. But let's be real. Let's go back to the impala or something. Okay, let's take it away from us. How long, you've seen in the Nat Geo docos and all mm. the things, right? How long is the lioness chasing the impala? We're talking 15 minutes? <laughs> 10 minutes? To, give me I a number. Know, like, what do you reckon? Curse, I can see your yeah, face. Yeah, like seven minutes. I have seven if minutes by themselves. I don't, I have like no yeah. idea. Seconds? Tell us, John. <laughs> 30 seconds. Bin's on 30 yeah. seconds. Curse on seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Some somewhere short, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Because if the impala is able to run for for let's let's say five minutes, man, that's a fast impala or a slow lion. <laughs> okay. And usually, you know, she's got her friends around, right? Yeah. So so it's a short term burst. If the impala gets the jump and gets away and gets I don't know across the river or down the ravine or yeah. whatever, then the lioness says, Ah, oh, couldn't be bothered. I'll, I'll find another one. There'll be a slower one tomorrow. Sort of thing, yeah. So the whole point is, and the same thing that we talked about with us in, in terms of muscle tension, breathing, all of that happens in the Impala. She doesn't have the logical thinking that, that humans have that I said. So that's not happening in her, but it's still all instinct, but it's, she can afford to throw everything at that for the 30 seconds, minute, two minutes that she's in pursuit. Mm. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter anyway. If it works, great, she got away with it. She can't be running for 30 minutes like that. She just doesn't have the juice in the tank. She just doesn't have the energy. She can't even be running for 10 or 15 minutes because there's not enough there. And so let's bring it back to us. When we face something threatening or a stress and it's pushing us into this big, I have to respond, then if it's threatening enough, running across a busy road or something, we need that response. It's healthy to get us across there. But you can't maintain, it's supposed to be a short-term thing. You can't maintain it. It's not it's not a 10 or 15 minute overdrive. It's a two or three minute tops overdrive where all of the resources, all of the energy, all of the everything goes into survive. And then we have to go into a recovery phase. If our impala runs for two or three minutes, she has to stop and recover because right in the next half hour is another lioness probably. And so she's got to be able to do the same thing again. Recovery is key. Mm. And so let's backtrack a second there's the three parts so you've got to recognize the stress if you don't you lunch you've got to respond appropriately if you don't you're in trouble but then you must recover and the whole thing that the recognized responders is a short burst we can afford that but let's unpack how long are most people in our society me included sitting in that overload mm. overdrive stress response what's oh, going on well we see them every day as our clients <laughs> So a long mm, time mm. and I think two things stood out for me with what you were saying there was the recognizing that we're actually in mm. a place of stress mm. and then the recovery part. So we end up stuck in the middle of just staying in an mm. extended place of fight or flight. So mm. no wonder we in in a session with a client, they get to a place where they just can't make any more decisions or they or they, they make is, the, yeah. the call in the first place to have us come in to help them because that 
frontal lobe actually can't that they can't actually it's disengaged it mm, it's disengaged yeah, yeah so yeah. hopefully that makes a few people feel a little bit better about the fact that it is hard it, there's an actual yep. reason your brain has switched that part off yep. because of the overwhelm mm. that you're in and unable to come out of mm, yeah, yeah yeah and so coming out of stress is crucial yeah. for growth but learning how to recover from stress because it's not taught to us. Like it's not like, hey, people come and learn how to turn off your stress. It's something that we're we trying to do, we do in practice and we do in coaching to try and create more awareness and strategies around those sorts of things. Because if you're stuck in the loop and that's all you've known, and society is just pushing you more and more to do more and more, then it, it's hard to get a grip on it. I won't dive into it unless you want me to, but where we talked about the long-term consequences of stress, if your heart rate and your blood pressure and your breathing rate and your muscle tension is up for long periods of time, what does that look like for people? Mm. I've experienced it. I imagine you girls have experienced it too, is that we just get into this state of everything's going and, and, and our normal becomes tense with a high heart rate, high blood pressure, high breathing rate. I remember I talked about organ function goes down because we don't need it in the stress response. So all of a sudden our metabolism, our blood sugars, our ability to produce energy gets all skewed because it's trying to figure out how do I have these constant bursts. Our hormones get challenged, our digestion gets challenged, our immune system gets challenged, and we start to plug that over a long-term spectrum. And, and now we start to see some of the challenges that as a society we face and I guess one thing I want to talk about, I love to talk about, is that there's hope to change this. This is not just all like, oh, no, we're all challenged, we're all stuck, we're all like, this is <laughs> there's it. There's no hope. But, yeah. No, <laughs> there, there is pointless? Is <laughs> yeah. Give it up. I'm stopping. No, no, no. It, it's, it's, it's what we have to think differently about how we have to recognize the yeah. challenge and then think differently about it. Yeah. I was just thinking about that that recognition. I think that yeah. that's the thing that stood out to me the most is that mm. particularly with, I think with anything, is that our bodies are recognising it but our we're not recognising it. Like so our bodies are switched on. It's so intelligent. It knows that it's yeah. not safe and it yeah. is switched this all on but mm. we haven't been present to that. So we don't know that actually we're operating at this higher level, like our mm, all of mm. everything that you're saying, because we're not recognizing that actually it's the clutter in our house that's causing us stress, or it's the relationship yep. that isn't going as well that's causing mm. us stress, or it's yeah. our physical health that we've just like, oh, she'll be right, she'll be right, that's causing us stress. It's the chemicals mm. that we're putting on and in our body that's causing us stress, but we're not even recognizing it. Like, so, yeah. you know, you talk about recognition, but there is those two parts to it. It's the, like the automatic, our body automatically recognizes it, but we yeah. haven't recognized it. There's a disconnect mm. at a lot of levels between what's happening for me mentally, cognitively, emotionally versus what's actually happening under the surface. Mm. And the automatic nature is beautiful because we don't have to think about mounting a stress response but in a busy world where lots of demands are on our time, as we say, we're in that all the time. We don't know any different. If finding that reconnect is is also a huge part of it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I That's one part that I love about chiropractic is that it locates where the disconnect is. Like your brain mm. is in control of everything. It's talking to every single thing in your mm -hmm. body. And this kinds of stress, they're going to cause a disconnect somewhere where your brain's actually unable, it's not connected. It can't speak to that or whatever it is that's happening, that the issue is coming mm -hmm. up. And the whole point yeah. of an adjustment is to bring that connection back together. So for myself, I totally. love that. For me, it is one strategy that I have in place in my life to help me manage all the stresses. And I love that, yeah. you know, getting adjustment is like, oh yeah, you know, a, let's turn the power back on. Like there's a disconnect here. And I think I love that because I still think that's a great tagline, turn the power back on. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's happening. Like we've just been talking about the fact that, yeah, we are disconnected to the awareness of what's actually, you know, there's mm -hmm. the awareness of what's happening and then understanding what the next level of understanding of what's actually going on. Yeah. It's, it's pretty huge. And again, if we dive deeper into 
Uh, you talk about mm. the adjustment and the connection. As we stay in this stress response, our prefrontal cortex gets turned down. So that logical thinking and creativity that makes us be able to relate well and listen well and reason well and, and communicate and connect with others, not just internal connection, but connect with others, that gets dealt down into a response, like instinctive mm. response. And um, do you remember I talked about the, the part of the brain that's looking for stress? Here's, here's one thing is that if we stay in the stress response, that part of the brain, it's called the amygdala. Yep. I mentioned it earlier. It's a small part of the brain, but on scans like MRIs and stuff, it physically gets bigger if we stay in a stress response. This is this oh, is wow. neuroplasticity, and which I guess it's a rabbit hole to dive in. We won't okay. necessarily, but <laughs> but it physically gets bigger. And so imagine it being like imagine you had a smoke alarm in your house mm -hmm. that was there to detect smoke because you've got to respond, right? And so you recognize before you respond. And so little smoke alarm picks up. It's got to be a lot of smoke before it responds, but it's, that's what it's there for. Imagine if you had a massive smoke alarm that was super mm. sensitive to even the smallest bit of smoke. Apart from being super yeah. annoying, it would be going off all the time. All the time. That's what makes it mm. annoying. So put this in the brain and how what's happening for a lot of people, your clients, my clients, people in our world, is that, their smoke alarm is enormous. Their, their, their brain's looking for stresses, something threatening has gotten big, physically bigger. Like the, the, the neurons in there have got physically more connected and, more, and bigger because it says, you know what, this is really dangerous, this world that I live in. I have to be looking for every little sign of danger. So I need to be really big and switched on and, and on all the time. And so what that means is that the smallest little things, they, they blow up into bigger things. It's just like the smallest bit of smoke, boom, off goes the alarm and away you go. Out comes a fire brigade and whatever it is, <laughs> yes. okay, because it's like it just happens. Yeah. And, yes. and the, the best thing to do is to, to turn down the size of the smoke yeah. alarm because as that gets bigger, prefrontal cortex, other parts of the brain that do memory and learning and concentration, they all come down because the brain's like, ah, lions everywhere. Got to be looking always, lions, lions, lions. And so... There are people, we know them, I, we've been them, right, at times where the world's overwhelming a little bit and everything is setting us into this place of challenge because we're looking for lions under everything automatically. Like you said, Kirst, the brain is automatically trying to recognise this, even if our own cognitive awareness, our thought process is not finding it, the brain's still doing it because yeah. it thinks, I have to. Wow. All right. Let's move into recovery. <laughs> I yeah, want to know how you solve this. How do we give me a quick fix, John? Give me a quick, quick fix. fix. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, good luck yeah. with that. Well, I was going to yeah. say, is it possible yeah. to remove stress? Is that the fix we're looking for? Is is Or are we barking up the wrong tree? Uh, I'm going to fire the question straight back at you. Is it possible to remove stress? <laughs> yeah, you, the, we <laughs> wish it was. We wish it was. That's what you brought me on here, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, well, there's some hit... stresses that are good. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, being, yeah, this yeah. is it. It's Kirst. good to go okay. to the gym. It's good yep. to have conversations with friends that are challenging. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. And so it's it's impossible to remove stress. Uh, let's add in that, that gravity itself is a stress. It's pulling us towards the earth. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. we didn't have gravity, if you're an astronaut out in space with no gravitational pull, what happens to muscle tone and strength? It would probably become really weak. Yeah, these, these guys, I don't know, don't quote me on this, but they can't walk when they first come back from outer space because they've had no gravitational stress on their body. Their bones are more brittle. Their muscles are broken down because they're not having that. So stress is actually like it's it's what helps us be strong and grow. So, so if we take that not just out of the physical stress but we put it into the context of even emotional stress can help us grow, it's important. We can't get rid of it, but we can minimize it. We can uh, learn about stress. We can say, where's my overload point? How do I, Kirsten, as you said, how do I become more aware of it? How do I see what the different stresses are? There's certainly stresses that you can minimize that you can say, I don't, I don't need to be doing that. 
I don't need to be pushing this. I don't need to be racing there. I don't, uh, all of those things. We can recognize those. I think as a society, we do this ostrich thing a lot where we kind of know, but we put our head in the sand and hope that it'll just sort of pass on by. Oh, I've um, never done that. I don't know no, what you're talking no, no, no. about, it's, John. It's not a strategy <laughs> any of us have found before, <laughs> but that's it, isn't it? We've got to like, oh, hopefully just, oh, hopefully it'll be all right. And that that can help a little bit, but but really it takes courage to go, what is going on in my world? Let's let's mm-hmm. do an audit. Let's have a look. Let's see what's going on because stress is okay, but too much is too much. And so yep. minimizing what we can and adapting to what we can't is crucial. And so how we adapt to the strategies and the, the tactics, I think, if you say, what are the things that I do on a consistent basis, not just as a quick fix once sort of life hack thing, but what do I do consistently that is going to help me to adapt to the stresses that I can't remove? I was talking to someone recently in practice with aging parents, and that's a big stress, and they're working through all of these things. She can't make that go away, but she can get her internal resilience stronger, her ability to adapt to those stresses better so that she can be present for her aging parents, so that she can think logically, because if she just gets overwhelmed by it, she doesn't make great decisions. This is a very case-specific way to do it, but you see the point. You can't just take that off your plate. Even though you would love to, you can actually say, it's on my plate. I need to be strong and resilient to adapt to it. I can also have an opportunity to grow and learn through it, which we often don't see straight away, okay? But understanding all of those things, connecting with yourself as well helps you to know, am I past overload? Am I not past overload? Yeah. And of course, there's ways to measure that more technically. Uh, where are you on your overload spectrum? And that's something we, we dive into in the, the coaching space. But um, but yeah, as a concept, that's, that's where it's at. Yeah, because yeah. my heart for our curious ones is that they reduce the stress that clutter is putting on them so that they can turn their attention to having that resilience to cope with the other stresses that they can't remove. <laughs> looking yeah. after, you know, yeah. looking after children, looking after aging parents, doing their job yeah. well, caring for their family as well. All that can be stressful. And I'd rather them be turning their attention to the things <laughs> to be building their resilience mm-hmm. because they've cleared the clutter. Yeah. And they're maintaining good habits in their home to keep mm. the clutter at bay so that they can be turning their attention to the way more important things of life. Yeah. Which is not cleaning their house and yeah. <laughs> not clearing yeah. the clutter constantly. <laughs> can, can I tell you a little story about that? And I know obviously clutter is the big thing. One of the principles that I coach around is the idea that growth is a shedding process, it's not an accumulation <laughs> process. And so we think. Our society kind of teaches us the more we have, the more we'll grow and the better we are. But really, the more we have, the more we have to steward. Mm. The more real estate it takes up in our brain unconsciously, it's sort of sitting there like I've got all of these things. And that clutter in the physical happens in the cognitive, mental, emotional as well. But in about 20, what year was it? 20, we did it first in 2013, then 2016, my wife and I decided we are going to. Before I, before I knew you, Kirst, but didn't we knew each other. Mm-hmm. But we, we're just going to get rid of a heap of our stuff that we're just not using. We just got heaps of it. And so we actually cut what we owned by at least 50%. We did it on two occasions. And and uh, we lived real simple for a little while. And just the, the clarity that that brought in head, like it was hard work. It's hard work to declutter, but it's hard work to live with clutter. Mm-hmm. It's like it's you go left, it's hard declutter you go right it's hard declutter it's like we'll choose which hard you want because they're both hard okay so do i choose the hard that's the declutter that's going to take work but gives an outcome or do i choose the hard that's maintain clutter and gives an outcome of more clutter and so that just the clarity that that created as a personal experience a personal story was was enormous and allowed us to see a lot of things in our world. And so here's the concept again, growth is a shedding process. Decluttering is shedding. It's saying I don't need to hold all of these things because they're cluttering my physical, but my mental, my emotional, my relational world as well. And so how do I, how do I address that? And I know that that's, that's your jam. That's what you, you are doing. And it, it flows right back to the very things we're talking about. 
So do you have tips, some specific tips on how, what we can do around building our resilience to stress and managing our stress? Yeah, yeah. There, there are little things that you can do, things like breathing and, and, and being in the sun and, and all of those things are necessary. And then we can talk more about those things in a sec. But I think the, the mindset around it, the thinking around it is the first thing to recognize that each person has the opportunity to choose. And we can, I, I know, I get it. We can feel like we're in a place where all choice is gone from us. But really, if we look and we work with somebody like like the way that you guys are navigating and helping people to see, you go, well, what choices can I make? And this starts to give us the, the sense of agency and the sense of like, I, I have some ownership in where I'm going and how I'm doing it. And then we can start to address why am I busy? Now, some busyness we can't get rid of, but there is busyness that we can, uh, I imagine. So it comes back to the way we think about it and the buzzwords mindset, and and that's kind of the right word, but it's not just like, no, you've got to think and be powerful and pretend it's not there and 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 affirm yourself that you can do this. Like in my world, the way that I, I coach and stuff, you're dancing in lying to yourself that it's just all going to be okay. And I get the affirmations thing, but but that you've also got to be truthful with yourself and have rapport. And as you were saying before, Kirst, connecting with yourself and know what's happening and not just I'm fine. It's okay if if I'm going to do it and and have all these loose affirmations. So firstly, it comes back to the idea of like the way you think about your life, the perspective you have over your life to see, you know what, in the big scheme of things, I'm, I'm getting bogged down in the littles. So let me zoom back, zoom way back and go, what's really, really important to me for where I'm going as a person, as a family, as a family leader, if it's in business, in whatever, what's, what's the outcome that I'm pursuing? And then under that, I can start to put strategies in that might be, I'm going to spend more time with my family. I'm going to spend more time there. And so outcome first, thinking first, what are we trying to achieve with it all? And then we go into the specifics of, well, what's my strategy to achieve that? And then the tactics like, well, I'm going to uh, spend time in the sun in the morning. Like, it's great. But if you don't know why you're doing it or what it's leading to, then it just becomes another thing on your plate, another thing I've got to do. And uh, it's another, like people use the word hack, like life hacks and all these things. Like it's just, it's another thing, right? And that's just more on my plate. But if you come back to thinking, perspective, and the outcome you're trying to achieve in the big scheme, then you can plug in the little things and they have more purpose. They have more meaning and there's more, they don't become burdensome. Now they become liberating because you're actually got a clue as to why it is. As I say, you sit in the sun for five minutes in the morning before the day starts, whatever it is. And I can help you with the small tactics. They're easy. Consistency is hard. Getting your outcome, getting clear, getting purpose, getting perspective. These are the bigger topics. They need addressing. They don't get addressed quickly, but I just encourage you, if you're listening to this, start to think, well, why am I doing all of this? What does it matter? Ah, sometimes that's a confronting question because maybe you can't find the answer to it. But if you can, then it can start to shape why you do what you do. Yeah, I love that. Uh, The thing that just stood out for me so much was purpose. And I think the first thing we do with clients is we're like, let's set the vision. Like when we're mm. talking about a session, like mm. what, why are we here? Like, yeah. what do you want this space to look like? What do you want yeah. this space to feel like? What are That's the problems? Like, and actually really setting that because mm-hmm. then that gives you something to come back to. So as you said, you know, sit out in the sun. Well, if you're just doing it for the sake of doing it, it becomes another thing on your to-do list. Yeah. But connecting that with purpose, I think is yep. such a key to, you know, we talk about habits and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's, I know for my my daughter, that's a huge thing for her when she really understands the purpose of something, it gives it meaning yeah. to her and she will mm-hmm. do it. Otherwise, it. there that's is it. no way that that thing is getting done. <laughs> yeah. It's just another thing to do. And, and yeah just another thing to have to manage and fit in. And I imagine in the, like, I love the fact you start with vision and purpose for the decluttering thing, because really, I don't know, you guys have got way more experience in this than me, but uh, what does the clutter represent? Does it represent a a lack of purpose and a lack of vision? And so therefore a, a feeling of needing to accumulate and hold on because we're not quite sure what direction it's all going to go. So we better just hold on to all of it. Yeah, which of course is exhausting, and 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 
um, brain breaking, if you want to call it that. Like you just can't emotionally and physically and, and stuff. You can't relationally. You can't. So yeah, interesting. Uh, but it's the hard work, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, like, whoa! Don't ask me about purpose and vision. Just tell me what I should do. <laughs> All right. There, there are there are sheds full of self-help books and and tips and strategies and this and that and and they're all great but if you don't know where it fits then i mean yeah hard work hard work so the harder work is coming back to where does it fit then everything else becomes easy yeah Mm. i think that might be a great place to leave it for today you may hear from us all again but i just (laughs) i think that's awesome i thank you so much for your time john appreciate it you're a busy man who wears many hats (laughs) <laughs> that's all fun though it's all yeah fun. and we appreciate your expertise and we really hope that from today our listeners have been able to have more of an understanding of of stress and that not all stress is bad yeah uh, we just thank you so much it's a pleasure absolutely well if you want to find out more about the amazingness that is jonathan moore you can head over to his website it's www.legacycoaching.io and we'll put a link to it in the show notes he talks lots more about stress over there and he's just a brilliant coach and if you're in the hills in sydney and you're looking for a Cairo, then you can find out more through that link as well and you might see ben and i there if you come at the same time as us (laughs) which you may not be because we're often there at the same time and there's no room for anybody else Um, thank you for being a brilliant friend to both of us, John, and thank you for coming on the podcast. And we can't wait to have you on again sometime soon. Yeah, I'd love to be on again. And I just love what you guys are doing in terms of helping people move forwards with a bunch of this stuff and not just feel overwhelmed by practical strategies on the ground. It's making a massive difference. So well done with what you are doing. Mm, Thank you. But until next week, curious ones, we can't wait and we'll be back then. Bye.